Jericho. Now, most of us, if we've been around, we've probably seen some sort of uh, dramatic presentation of it. I used to actually watch um, a, a show from the 1960s called The Time Machine. Interesting fact. Does anybody remember that show, The Time mm -hmm. Machine? Sure you do. If you've been around, you know. And, and one of the stories that I used to love was the, the story of Joshua and the taking of the city of Jericho. Now, years ago, I also uh, heard a dramatic presentation from Carmen where they had actually a fellow named Malcolm Muggeridge do the actual presentation. And I think, if I remember correctly, it was also in the Pavilion of Promise back in Vancouver as well. So what I'm giving to you is, you know, for, if, I don't think anybody here has not heard the story, but if you haven't heard the story, you're going to hear it today. And it says basically the, type, the, the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of who? Because of the Israelites. Now the plan of attack, this is very interesting. Joshua, in Joshua chapter 5, was figuring out what to do. How could he take the city? You see, as far as he's concerned, it was going to be a major feat. They say that the walls of Jericho were about 70 feet high. And they said that the walls were probably so thick, about 30 feet thick, and uh, big enough or wide enough that you could actually run two chariots on top. Okay? Not cherries, chariots, just to make sure. Okay? So it was a pretty incredible feat. Now, I have been to Jericho. And the city of Jericho actually sits on the side of a mountain, at least the old part of Jericho. The newer part, of course, is down more towards the, the valley. But the actual city of Jericho, uh, in those days, what they would do is they build what they call a citadel. They built a great big huge tower. And then in the citadel is where the royal family would live. And then down below, they would have all the houses. And then what they would do is they, they, had the, they would have a wall that would fall around that. Now, this, the, uh, that is basically what, was, what Joshua was facing. Okay? And uh, so what he would have... Now, you have to understand, what they would have to do to take this city... Now, most of us don't... You know, we always think that the city of Jericho was on a flat plain. It was not. It was actually on the side of a mountain. So as they were going around the backside, they would have to climb that mountain. Did you know that? No. They did. They would actually have to climb an inclination of about seven degrees. Has anyone ever driven up the Selmo Creston Highway? The Selmo Creston Highway is seven degrees. Okay? And the Selmo Crescent Highway is about 30 kilometers straight up that way. It's tough in a car. Well, no. Can you imagine doing that seven times in one day? Oh. That is what the nation, this nation of Jer uh, the nation of Israel was facing. They weren't just walking around a nice level plain field, you know. They were walking. They go up one side. They come down the other side, and they would do that. No wonder they only did it once a day. Maybe they were getting ready for the seventh day. They were doing six days of step training. And then on the seventh day, they decided, okay, we're going to take it. Well, that's the uh, interesting. And now, the other part that was very interesting is that they were also, I felt sorry for the priests, because the priests were playing instruments during that entire time. Can you imagine having to play a bugle? I mean... Uh, Tyson used to play a bugle all the time, right? Well, I'm sorry, a trumpet. A saxophone? Okay, saxophone. All right. Now, did, did you get tired after doing it for about an hour? Yeah, you get pretty tired, all right? Imagine trying to do that all day. You know? that, And also going on an incline while you're doing it. Talk about getting into shape fast. That's what they were dealing with, okay? I know the, the, whenever you see the, uh, the uh, presentation, they've got them going around on this nice little flat plane. That is not what was happening. 
So I just wanted to clarify that for you. Well, what do we learn here? The first lesson we learn from verses 1 to 6 is, you can take your world for God, but you got to do God's plan. See, here's Joshua trying to figure out how to do this. Now, in the last two or three verses of chapter 5, Joshua has an encounter. He has an encounter with an, an individual. And he says, who are you? Are you for us or are you against us? And the individual said, I am the commander of the Lord's host, the army of the Lord, and I want to talk to you. Take off your uh, sandals. And it was in that time that he got the plan. He said, Joshua, you are going to do this in a supernatural way. You're going to do it in such a way that the only way that this could actually be done is God would get the glory. He says, this is the plan. First of all, what you're going to do is you're going to have the Ark of the Covenant go before you. You see, before you can take any part of your land or your world, you've got to have the presence of God. Amen? Amen. It's, what jo it's what Moses said when Moses was on the mountain. He said, listen, Lord, we're not going to take one step until your presence goes before us. Moses understood that you need the presence of God. Now, many people these days are trying to do God's work in their own strength and their own power. And some have success. But the problem is, when you have a dead preacher giving a dead sermon to dead people, what do you have? Deadness everywhere, right? So you've got to have the presence of God. That's what Joshua understood. Now, in, David's, in Moses' time, the symbol of the presence of God was the staff. But when it was Joshua's time, it was the Ark of the Covenant. Remember when in, in Joshua chapter 3 and 4, when they went across the Jordan River? What did they do? They had the Ark go first, right? So what was happening is, the Ark was, was the symbol of the presence of God was going to be carried around the city with the trumpets blaring, all right? Now, that must have seemed very silly. Think about it, okay? You're going to go and take a city. Usually, what you would do is you take all the army, you get all the siege ramp put in there, you get all the siege material, and then you would take the city, right? And it would cost a lot of lives. But all of a sudden, here is old Joshua. He says, listen, this is how we're going to take the city. We're going to march around the city one time a day, for six days, we're going to have the Ark of the Covenant go before us. The priests are going to blow the ram's horn, and you guys are not going to say one single thing. But on the seventh day, after we've got you all ready to go, I mean, now that you've done, now you understand what they were dealing with, he says, we got to have six days to get you into shape. And once you get on that seventh day, you know what we're going to do? We're going to walk around the city seven times. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a lot of work. Right? Has anyone gone for an hour walk lately? Boy, I tell you, you go for an hour walk, that's a tough walk, right? Until you get ready for it. He says, on the seventh day, we're going to go around the city seven times. And then, when we go around the seventh time, we get to that certain spot, we're going to blow the ram's horn, and I want you to shout with all your shout, and the walls are going to come down. Okay, Joshua, you are my sugar in the head. But you know what they had learned? They learned that when God had a plan, God was going to fulfill that plan. Amen? You've got to have the presence of God. You've got to have the plan of God. And then, you know what happens? He says, next, you have to shout. Now, I checked that word out in the Hebrew. You know what the word, he, the word the Hebrew word for shout is? It's a word called Shabbat. And it, the shout is praised and given such a way before the answer comes, and then what happens is it, it, it drowns out any opposition. I mean, when you're shouting at somebody, can they get the conversation back to you? Of course not. Have you ever been in a situation where they have shouted? Let me tell you a story about my son, Robbie. He was five months old, and we went to a hockey game 
in Lethbridge, Alberta. That particular uh, hockey game was between the Calgary Flames and the uh, uh, Minnesota North Stars, now known as the, uh, uh, I think, Minnesota Stars. Right. <clears throat> but they were known as the North Stars. We went there, and Calgary scored their first goal. Well, when the goal was scored, everybody loudly gave a great big huge shout. And that woke Robbie up. And he howled through that whole shout. Nobody heard him. It was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. You have this kid, he's turning purple because of the fact that he's scared to death and nobody can hear him. Once it went down, you could hear him howling through the whole place. Okay? But during that shout, during that, and I mean it went on for about a minute. And he was howling for about a minute. And then when the howling stopped, here he was howling. And it, Lotus actually had to pick him up and carry him out because he was scared. But you see, that's what happens when you shout. God does some tremendous things. And there's, from time to time, times to shout. And you know something about shouting? It actually releases tension. Have you ever shouted and just felt so much better after you did it? I know I have. Okay? There have been times where I got mad at my kids and I shouted at them and I felt so much better. I don't know if they felt better, but I sure felt better. You know? The point that I'm trying to say is that it's the when you give an expression of what God has told you to do. See, God told them to shout. It was a it was a wild when you think about it, it's a pretty wild plan, isn't it? But you see, when you follow God's plan, some tremendous things happen. Now it goes on to say this, you know, um, look at verses uh, 6 right and following. It says, So Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and the seven priests carry trumpets in front of it, and he ordered the armor. He says, Advance, march around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Covenant, when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Covenant followed them. The armed guard followed ahead of the priests. They blew the trumpets, and near guard followed the Ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had commanded the army, Do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carry around the city, circling at once. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. Let me tell you a little bit about psychological warfare when it comes to war. Okay, In the ancient times, what they would do is they would shout with all their might. They would beat on their shields with their swords. And there was one purpose, and that was to create fear. Okay, that was the purpose of why they would do that. Has anyone watched a movie? Did you guys watch Lord of the Rings? Did you see how the, they pounded on their shields and yelled and screamed and ranted and raved? Part of that was also to get yourself psychologically psyched up because who knows? The next few moments, you may be that may be your last, right? But it was a form of psychological terror in the ancient world. Already the people were in Jericho were afraid. It was tightly shut up. They had been shut up for several days because of the, the, uh, the nation of Israel. They were already terrified. Can you imagine if they had decided to start doing the war cry? What were they doing? Why were they silent? Because God wanted to show what He could do. Amen? It wasn't about the men of Israel. It was about God. Amen? And we have to realize that. We are not going to win the battle in the battles of life when we rely on our own understanding, when we rely on our own power, when we rely on our own authority. You know what it says in Zechariah 4.6? Just after Zechariah 4.6, it says, What is a mountain to you, O Zerubbabel? It shall become a plain. That's verse number 5. Verse number 6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. That day, Joshua understood what that meant. 
It wasn't going to be by the might and the power of the Israeli army. It was going to be done by the power of God. Amen? That's why he told them, you do not do that. But I want you to notice, it said, first of all, advance, okay? You need to advance when God tells you to go ahead. The church needs to be on the move. We are called to go. Let me give you a little a thought here, okay? What is the first three letters in the name Satan? What is it? The first three letters? S-A-T. What is it? Sat. Right? What are the first two letters in God? Go. So, what do you want to do? Do you want to sit or do you want to go? It tells you, basically. It's it's a nice little illustration. We are called to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen? We are called to make disciples of all men. To baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are called to go. But the problem is, most of us have decided to sit. So, whose side are you on when you're sitting? You're sitting on Satan's side, right? So you need to go. You see... That's what the Lord said. Joshua said to people, Okay now, we've heard the word of the Lord. Now it's time to get to it. It's called simple discipline. That's what it means. Listen to what it says in Mark 16, 15 to 19. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. He says, Listen, it's very simple. He says you need to go and make disciples of everyone. And one of those illustrations, of course, or one of those things that shows people that they're saved is the baptism of water. But then he goes on to say in verse number 17, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name you will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, they will not hurt them. They will lay hands upon the sick and they will recover. These are the signs will follow them who believe. When was the last time you drove out a demon? You said, I'm scared of demons. You shouldn't be scared of them. You know why? Because the Bible says you have victory over them. Amen? But you've got to go. The demons aren't going to come to you. You've got to go to where they are. Pastor, you mean i got to go into a haunted house? No. Because when you're working in the power of God, you know what's going to happen? You're just going to run into them. That's what's going to happen. It goes on to say here that, you know, basically, you will be able to drive out demons. You'll be able to speak in new tongues. You'll be able to drink any deadly poison. That means that whatever Lance made this morning, when it came to coffee, you're going to be able to drink it because it's toxic waste, as far as I'm concerned anyway. All right. No, Lance, you make good coffee. At least I I think you do. I don't know how good. I've never drank his coffee, so I can't. Is that why Claude is making new coffee now? (laughs) Okay. It will, or you can drink Coke if you want to drink Coke. All right, that was that one. And uh, they will, it will not harm them. They can lay hands upon the sick and they will get well. Isn't that a great promise? Just lay hands on the sick. But you need to be obedient. They had to wait until Joshua told them to shout. It wasn't, they, they couldn't shout on the first day. They couldn't shout on the second day. They couldn't shout on the third day or the fourth day, the fifth day, even on the seventh day. They had to walk around that city seven times and only when they had walked around seven times and when Joshua said shout, that was when they were going to shout. Amen? You got to wait until God Himself or those that God is using to do that. I want to read something to you right now. It goes something like this. Leonard Wood once visited the king of France. And the king was so pleased with him, he invited him to dinner the next day. Now Sir Leonard went to the palace of the king, meeting him in one of the halls. And the king said, Why, Leonard, I did not expect you to see. How is it you're here? Did not your majesty invite me to dine with you? Said the astonished guest. Yes, replied the king. But you did not answer my invitation. Then it was then that Leonard Wood said this. In one of the choicest sentences of his life, he said, the king's invitation is never to be is never to be answered. It is to be obeyed. So when the king says you are to do something, you are to do something. The last words that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, 
He said, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Did, is he not the king? You are to simply obey, not answer. You are to obey. It says here in Joshua chapter uh, verse 12, he says, Joshua got up the next morning and took the priests up to the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carried the seven trumpets and went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord, blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets were sounding. So the second day they marched around the city and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day they got up at daybreak, marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except on that day they circled the city seven times. So all this verse is telling us the progression. Now remember, we had all the staging before this. Now these guys are simply doing it. They started off the morning of the second day, and they went around the city, and they circled the city one time. Then on the last day, they got up and they prepared to circle the city seven times. The, in, the, the um, answer is simple. You do the task. Faithfulness, diligence, persistence, endurance to finish well. Remember, it is not how you start that's important. It's how you finish. Let me read you a little story. It's from the Olympic Games of Mexico 1968. The marathon was the final event on the program. The Olympic Stadium was packed. And there was excitement as the first athlete, an Ethiopian eunuch, or a eunuch, <laughs> Ethiopian runner. Ethiopian runner, I don't know if he's a eunuch or not, <laughs> enters the stadium. The crowd erupts as he crosses the finish line. Way back in the field is another runner. His name is D John Stephen Akwawe. He's from Tanzania. Okay, He's been eclipsed by the other runners. After 30 kilometers, his head is thrumming, his muscles are aching, and he falls to the ground. He has a serious leg injury, and the officials want him to retire, but he refuses. And so what do they do? They bandage up his leg, and for the next 12 kilometers, he literally hobbles into the stadium. He comes in about an hour and a half after the, final, the first fella came in. Now most of the people have left, but he comes in and he hobbles, and... He goes around to the finish line and he literally collapses. It's one of the most heroic efforts in Olympic history. Afterward, the reporter asks him, why didn't you drop out? Alquari says this, my country did not send me here to start the race. They sent me to finish. So folks, if God gives you a task, you finish. You don't drop out. It may be hard. Your leg may be hurting. Your head may be throbbing. You may be totally tuckered out. You may have to literally carry yourself across the line. But God wants you to finish. Now let me just tell you that. That's not how it's going to be as a believer. You know why? Because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen? Amen. When you're weak in yourself, you can become strong. So this illustration is a human illustration. But the illustration is the fact that God wants you to finish well. Amen? Amen. You may get tired in the middle of the race. You may want to drop out. You may want to sit on the side of the road and just have a cup of coffee. And watch everybody go by, right? right. But you are called to finish. God did not call you to start. He called you to finish. Amen? You were sent to finish. Because one day you're going to stand before the Lord and you're going to give, you're going to hear those words. Or you should hear those words. Well done, thou good and faithful sinner. Enter into my rest. Because if you don't finish, you're going to hear something else. And you're going to hear the words, I'm sorry, I never knew you. Which word, which phrase would you rather hear? I would rather hear, well done. Amen? That's the phrase that I want to leave with you today. Now, let's look at the next part here, okay? 
it says this. It says, the seventh time around, now we're in verse number 16 just to help you along here. The seventh time around, when the priests had sounded the trumpet's blast, Joshua commanded the enemy, or commanded the army, I should say, shout, for the Lord has given you this city. The city and all that is to be de devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, of all who are in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so you will not bring your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring about trouble on it. All the silver and gold and all the articles of bronze and irons are sacred to the Lord and must go into His treasury. So when the trumpets sounded, the army shouted, and the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the walls collapsed so that everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men, women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Now folks, that sounds downright brutal, doesn't it? It really, really does. Now, I want you to follow for just a moment two thoughts. When God makes a promise, He's going to keep it. Amen? Amen? You see, two men, two young men, went and visited the city of Jericho before. And they had gone out to spy the land. And they had been protected by a young woman named Rahab. Now, they said that her um, profession was a prostitute, a harlot. But you see, God doesn't see what we are right now. Amen? He sees what we are going to become. He saw Rahab's cry of faith. And these two men had said, Listen, Rahab, if you leave that scarlet core down there, when the walls come down, when we take the city, if you are in your house, you will be protected. Now, it's interesting that they had marched around the city seven times. Then Joshua said, Shout! And at the same time that they were blowing the trumpets, there was a war cry, and immediately the walls all came down. Now, where was Rahab's house? It was on the wall. So the only place that was left was Rahab's house. God had remembered the promise. Isn't that interesting? You can make a promise in behalf of God, and God will honor that promise. Why? Because your representative, amen? Think about that for a moment. The authority of the believer. I just told you the authority of the believer in Mark 16, right? Verses 15 to 19. God will take your word and God will use that word to bless somebody in your family or your world. Amen? That was the promise. But also as well, Rahab had to get her family into the house. I want to leave you with another thought. And that's the promise of Acts 16.31. Do you have members of your family right now that are not saved? Do you have members of your family that are not serving the Lord and you are so deeply concerned about them? What you need to do is you need to pray for them. You need to ask God to touch their lives. Because the promise is that not only shall you be saved, but your household as well. We have three examples in the New Testament of God answering the prayer through one person and seeing salvation through one person. You see, the promise is that if you stay faithful to your work in the things of God, eventually God will affect your family. Amen? Amen. We have the wonderful promise of Cornelius. Remember Cornelius? Cornelius gathers all his family and all his friends and they, they gather together and they listen to Peter and guess what happens? Everybody gets saved in the house and filled with the Holy Ghost. Then there's another lady. Her name is Lydia. She's the first convert in Europe. And her entire family gets saved. That's what it says. The family got saved. And then you have the wonderful promise of Acts 16, 31, where the Philippian jailer not only gets saved, but his whole household. Listen, if you have family members that are not serving the Lord, keep praying for them. Be the ark of safety. Call them into that place of safety. Don't be afraid to tell them about Jesus. Because when you tell them about Jesus, you're giving them the best message of all. Amen? Amen. You tell them about Jesus, and then you pray like there's no tomorrow. Amen? Because there isn't no tomorrow. 
You don't know. Jesus may come back right now. You may hear, and guess what? We're gone. That's not Marnock Mar Margarine, by the way. All right, or Fleshman's or whatever it was that was. You know? What God wants you to do is stay on that. Also, the other lesson that we learn here is the lesson of leaving alone the things in this world. Amen? We are called to be holy and separate people. There are things in our lives, believe it or not, that are toxic. Habits that you have that you must get rid of. The Holy Spirit may be speaking to you this morning about a habit. He may be speaking to you about a particular thing that you do. Maybe you have a tongue that wags in the middle. Maybe you're a gossip. Maybe you're carrying some unforgiveness. Maybe right now you're mad as a hatter at somebody. Maybe right now you've been thinking about a member of your family that wronged you. Or maybe a person at work. I don't know. Maybe you do things by yourself that you shouldn't do. You need to get rid of those things. Because what we learn from this lesson is this. If those things are in your life, believe it or not, they're actually going to impact people around you. There's a philosophy today that goes like this. I can do anything I want because, you know, basically I am me. Right? They say, I'm, have you ever heard someone say, I'm not hurting anybody. Baloney. That's a lie of the enemy. Whatever you do affects people around you. For example, if you're walking around with unforgiveness in your heart, it's going to color everything that you do. It's going to color everything that you say. It's going to color every relationship that you have. Because you'll be thinking that everybody's going to hurt you just like that person hurt you, right? If you've been a subject of a gossip, it's going to affect everything you do because it's, you're going to think that everybody's going to gossip about you, right? Do you understand how toxic things are? Well, we can stop the madness, right? By saying, Lord, I am going to lay aside those sins and weights that so easily beset me, and I'm going to keep my focus on Jesus, and I'm going to keep my eyes and my life. I'm going to watch what I say. I'm going to watch what I think, and I'm going to watch what I do. You can do that. John actually tells us that we can have victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. But it takes, it, it takes discipline every single moment. Well, pastor, are you telling me I can't give up for a moment? No. Because the devil won't give up. Amen? He will use every single trap he can. Let me tell you what happened to me on Tuesday night. I'm out there walking, doing a prayer walk, and I'm thinking to myself, should I walk around the Mormon church? I was getting ready to walk around the Mormon church and claim it for the Lord. <laughs> you know, I used to be Mormon. So I walk, I'm walk. i walking up there. All of a sudden, this car pulls up, and there's these two beautiful young women. And I'm thinking to myself, why are two young, beautiful women checking out an old man like me? They said, come here. So I came over. And they said, how are you tonight? I said, fine. And we chatted for about a minute. And then I asked them, I said, what do you guys want? Oh, we're Mormon missionaries. Oh, I could hardly wait. For me, it was like fresh meat. The reason I say that is because when you're a former Mormon, you know exactly what to say to them. About three, four minutes later, they said, we got to go. I said, you got to leave so soon? I said, I'm just getting started. We're finished. <laughs> Folks, as I walked away, I thought, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That was a situation where the enemy had set something up, but he wasn't ready for what was going to happen. I was prepared because I've had these conversations many, many times. It doesn't make me wiser than anybody. It just, when you've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, you learn the lessons. Amen? But you've got to get rid of those things that are toxic in your life and your situation. you got to eradicate them. That's why, for example, when I was 16 years old, I quit smoking. Now, there are folks that smoke. I'm, I'm not denying that. Okay? But I'll tell you why I gave it up. All right? First of all, it was, it was killing my body. I grew up with two parents that smoked. 
Okay? My dad didn't give up smoking until the, he, until the doctor said, you got cancer, you got to get rid of it. And so he did. And my mom didn't stop smoking until she had something happen in her life that made her stop. So I grew up with it. But I rejected smoking because I knew what it was doing to my body and what it was doing to my family. And that's the reason why. It was a health issue. Okay? To me, it was a health issue. The other day I was driving down the road and, and there was this mom and she was smoking and she opened up the door to pick up her kid and the thing just waffled in and the kids are, ooh, what is that smell? And I'm thinking, that's smoking. One little kid said, boy, that's something I'm not going to do. I said, thank you, Lord. He was only five years old. Thank you, Jesus. And he said that. Okay? There are things toxic in our lives. Now look at verses 22. We need to finish this up. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her, in accordance to her oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying out went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, on all who belonged to her. And they brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp. What a great story of household salvation. Amen? That's why I love this story. Because Rahab, her mom and dad, her brothers and sisters, her aunts and uncles, and anyone who wanted to come in, guess what? They got saved. They were protected. And that's what God wants us to do. That's why we can do right now in this moment. Why don't we just do that? Let's just take a moment. Would you close your eyes? Take this moment. Is there a member of your family that wants to get, you want to get saved? Let's pray. Father, today we pray for our loved ones. We pray that, Lord, right now in Jesus' name, that you would intervene in their lives. Acts 16.31, this says, not only shall we be saved, but our household as well. Father, you see them in our mind's eye right now. You see their face. And, Lord, we're claiming them for you right now. We pray that, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that every fetter and chain that is around them, that is keeping them from you, will be absolutely broken. That, Lord, today... You would send someone into their lives that would remind them about you. And Lord, if it is us, give us the wisdom, the compassion, and the understanding to do that right now. We claim that promise in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Claim that person. Claim that prayer right now in Jesus' name. Because we have those promises. Now, also as well, let's look at the last person, the last part. So they burned the whole city and everything in it. But they put the silver and the gold and the articles of brawn and iron into the treasury of the Lord's treasury. And Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she had hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And he, she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, Joshua pronounced a solemn oath. Cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild the city of Jericho at the cost of his firstborn, and he will lay its foundation at the cost of his youngest, and he will set up the gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. The first lesson we learn is simply this. Joshua eradicated everything. Now, why did Joshua eradicate everything? Because there wasn't anything of value in that place. You say, wait a minute. There were men and women. There were cattle and sheep and goats and all these things. Weren't any of them worth of any value? Of course not. Why? Because when God decides that it's the end of a situation and an end of a life, guess what? It ends. And when God pronounces judgment, judgment comes. That's what we need to realize. You see, when we studied the book of Revelation, remember all the judgments of God and how severe they were and how terrible they were? God is judging nations right now. In fact, God is judging our nation right now. You say, what do you mean by that? Folks, we just delivered a $10 billion deficit in the province of Alberta. All right? I don't know about you, but that sounds like judgment to me. Right? We just took on a $30 billion deficit uh, deficit in the, prob in the nation of Canada. Folks, you and I who live in the real world, okay, no, we're not talking about politicians who are spending money for the next and next and next generation. But you know that if you don't have money at the end of the month, the telephone company, the gas company, 
the uh, uh, whatever company it is that has your t utilities, you don't have money, guess what they're going to do? They're going to cut off your resources, right? So you need to... What is it about people of this generation that we think that sooner or later we're going to get away with it? Sooner or later we have to pay the piper. Amen? Yeah. That's the real world. But you know what? The judgment of God is on this nation. Why? Because the simple fact is that we don't follow simple rules. There are simple things that we need to follow, right? When there's a time of famine, or I should say a time of, of feasting, guess what you do? You put away enough to take care of the famine. One of the greatest stories of the Old Testament is the story of, of Joseph, remember? He got elevated to the position of prime minister because he had a because the Pharaoh had a dream, and the dream was there's going to be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. Joseph said, You know what you need to do? You need to put aside enough to take care of the famine. And when he did, when everything was falling apart, guess what? Joseph became the savior of the world, didn't he? God placed him ahead of time. So the simple fact is that there's a time of feast and there's a time of famine. Unfortunately, we kind of got it backwards these days, don't we? And so the judgment of God is going to come because these things happen. We have some freakish weather happening all the time, all over the place. Why? Because the judgment of God. God looks at us and says, what are you guys doing? Please follow my principles and things will turn up. As I close, we find some interesting things. Did you know that Rahab, for example, met or married a young man whose name was Salmon? He was the son of Abinadad. Abinadad was one of the sons of Judah, the leader of the nation of Judah. She married the leader of Judah. His name was Salmon. He was one of the young men who probably was in that, uh, the Jewish rabbis say that he was one of the young men that visited, or one of the spies, that's what they say. I don't know if it's true or not, but she did marry a guy named Salmon. And she became a direct descendant of a guy named David. And in turn became a, became a um, uh, direct descendant of Jesus Christ. Amen? Isn't that a great story? That's a great story. You know, there's a reward for faithfulness and acts of, of faith. Now, I just want to close with one thing. thing. You say, what happened to the city of Jericho? Well, I want you to turn in your Bibles for just a moment to 1 Kings chapter 16, 34. I just want to say this as we close, because the Bible says that they did. You know, the city of Jericho is rebuilt. Okay? I've been there. It's a beautiful city, actually. It's a fabulous city. Did you know that the average temperature in Jericho is 89 degrees? Hmm. Self, I'm sorry, Fahrenheit every day? That's what it is, every single day. Okay? They don't get the mixes of, of, of temperatures. It's one of the most beautiful spots on the planet. It really is. They got palm trees. Okay? And it's, the temperature is 89 every day. 1631 says, In Ahab's time, he Isle of Bethel built Jericho. He laid his foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up his gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segeba, in accordance to the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. This guy decided to rebuild this guy named Heil. He decided to rebuild the uh, city of Jericho. It cost him his oldest son and his youngest son. Jericho, David, uh, Joshua had put that forward. Do you know when God even brings a curse or a promise, it will come to pass? Amen? That's what we need to understand. So if God makes a promise to you today, He's going to answer it. Last thought. The Lord was with Joshua. The Lord is with you. His angels camp around us. Matthew 28, 20 reminds us. It says... The, the, um, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Let me close with this. I've got to read this. I've got to put my glasses up straight here. 
Drugstore security guard Louis D. Hairston of Washington, D.C. believes the New Testament is good for body and soul. Let me tell you why. A masked bandit recently lunged at him with a foot-long butcher's knife. The New Testament Harrelson carried in his breast pocket for spare time reading absorbed what was otherwise going to be a fatal thrust. In the ensuing struggle, the assailant was slain. He was killed, he said, he would have killed me except for the Bible, remarked Harrison, noting that the knife had severed the hardback cover of the volume. He said the life of the police officer in the town where he grew up had been also saved by a bullet in the same manner. He says, I've never forgotten that. So the story was that the security guard was saved by his New Testament, and another policeman in the same town was saved from a bullet because of carrying his New Testament. Now, I'm not saying that she should go out and try to find an assailant or try to find a robber and carry your New Testament. That is not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying to you is God can protect you. Amen? The Lord will be with you every step of the way. And guess what? Your fame, like David and like Joshua's, will be throughout the land and throughout your world. You know, you can actually be famous in your world. You say, really? Yes. But not in your own fame, but in the Lord's. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you today for what we've learned today.